There are six activities that are involved in any kind of work. I don't care if you're launching a startup company, if you're running a business, if you're building your family's home, you're running your household, you're planning a family vacation. There are six kinds of activities that are always required. And none of us are good at all six. In fact, of those six, two of them are what we call our working genius. Everybody has two that, that, that feeds them, that gives them joy and energy. When we work in our area of genius, we can spend 12 hours a day doing it and go home and feel like that was awesome. And then there's two on the other end that drain us of joy and energy. Two or three hours of doing that can make us exhausted. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. I'm so excited for today's episode because I get to chat with a dear friend of mine, someone I consider a mentor who has made a huge difference in my life and helped me in my mission and in my work in big ways. His name is Patrick Lencioni, and he's the founder of Table Group. He's also the author of over a dozen books that have sold millions and millions of copies. Pat and I discuss in particular the tool of the working genius and how using working genius, we can better optimize ourselves both in our workplace as well as in our relationships and our family life to understand our talents and other people's gifts and ensure that we are working in harmony together. I think you're going to enjoy this episode and this conversation with Patrick Lencioni. I know that I did. Pat Lencioni, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. This is like I was just saying to you, this is, this is not work. This is fun. Talking to you and... <laughs> And talking to your audience, this is a blast for me. Okay. Well, I'm so delighted that you agreed to come on today. You have been such a huge influence in my life when it comes to my work, my vocational work. You helped me with live action. Live action's grown so much since you came alongside us several years ago and really mentored me. You gave me a lot of the skills and the courage to launch now GTB Media, this show, and so much more. So I'm just very excited to share your wisdom with our audience because you have so much to teach many people about how to really build successful careers in a way that is most healthy for their flourishing and for the people they work with. So thank you for that work and thank you for everything you've done for me. Well, I'll never forget that day that somebody on your staff called me and said, hey, I work for Lila Rose and she'd like to. And I said, Lila Rose, she's my hero. <laughs> so I said, whatever she wants me to do. And when you tell Lila Rose, whatever you want me to do, you put us to work. And I love that. Well, so. we did put you to work. You gave us a lot of your time, and I'm so grateful for that. And super, super excited to jump in today because you've written multiple books. I think you've sold over 8 million books, which is crazy now. And your tools that you've developed to serve leaders and businesses have been, I think, life-changing for many, many people. So I wanted to start with first the why. What got you into building Table Group? What got you into writing about organizational health? Why you're passionate about it? You know, I think the the, the why is. I mean, I, I hope it's been a vocation and a calling. I'm, I, 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 as I'm older, I want to do whatever God wants me to do. And and uh, I think when I was a young kid, I saw my dad go to work and come home and be frustrated. And I thought, I don't know what that is, but that doesn't seem right. And then I got out of college and I got a job at a management consulting firm, and I was like, people don't seem to work very well together. And that's interesting to me, and that's not what the, the firm did. So I just started learning about that on my own and wanting to make a difference in the, the work lives of people. And so that's kind of how this came about. You know, I've always been a believer of Jesus and wanting to help people. And I thought that doing it through organizational health was better than marketing and strategy and all that stuff. So God just kind of kept opening doors for me. And I wrote my first book thinking that I would take it to Kinko's and give people <laughs> copies of it, but people bought it. And a publisher liked it, and now I'm 14 books in, and consulting firm has grown. And so I, I can't say I planned any of this. It's all been very accidental, but it's been a blessing. Awesome. What was one of your first big aha moments about dis maybe discovering or inventing tools, frameworks for understanding work that you've had? What was one of those first moments where you're like, wow, I just discovered this thing or I invented this thing that people didn't know about before that can be so transformative if people just knew this thing? That's a great question. And, and I have a moment. You know, I, I know what the answer is. I was working at, um, at a software company and I was like a junior executive. Um, I don't think at that point I reported to the CEO. It was a fairly good sized company. But I, on the side, I was doing free consulting to these other organizations because that's kind of how I am. I'm like you, you know, we, we're busy and all these things. And I started to notice a pattern in these CEOs in the way they behaved. And I, I was like, oh, wait a second. His problem is this and her problem is this. And then that leads to this. And, and I came up with these five 
leadership challenges, problems, if you will. And I just started sharing it with the people I was working with, and they liked it. And then like six months later, somebody came into my office and started talking about this theory. And I said, where'd you hear that? And they, and they said, uh, we heard it from you six months ago. So they were repeating it. And then one of my free clients said, you need to write a book about that theory. And I said, really? And they go, yeah, if you don't write it, somebody else is. And I thought, oh, I, maybe I will. So it was, I, I just came up with a theory in, in, when I was working and people were repeating it and using it. And that's the day I thought, well, maybe there's something to this. And that, it took off from there. What was the theory, Pat? <laughs> it was the five temptations of a CEO. And mm -hmm. it was like, I, there was this one guy that I was working for who really didn't care about the results of the company, believe it or not. He just wanted to be cool. He wanted to be, mm -hmm. he wanted status more than results. And I thought, okay, that's the problem with CEOs. And then I thought, well, but the previous CEO, he didn't care about status at all. Oh, he didn't like to hold people accountable. He wanted to be everybody's mm -hmm. buddy. I said, oh, so it leads to that. And then this other guy that I'm working with, he doesn't care about that. He just doesn't like to make a decision. He wants certainty over clarity. And so I just kind of unwound this thing and then started sharing it with people. And so it was The Five Temptations of a CEO, which was my first book, which then led to The Five Dysfunctions of a Team in a different application, which was my third book. And that was the one that really took off. Amazing. All right. There's so much ground I want to cover. We've got limited time with you. So I want to start with immediately the questions that I know people might be thinking to ask who are listening. And I want okay. to start with the question of somebody who is trying to find a job where they feel they're really using their gifts and growing their gifts. It's also making them money that they can hopefully grow their career in and how they can put those pieces together. Because I think a lot of people look at college, they look at entering the workforce and they kind of want to get in there somehow. Maybe they're struggling with what am I good at? What do I want to do? There's so many vocational questions when somebody is starting out their career or maybe they're in their career and they're unhappy with it. They feel like they're not really suited to what they're doing. What's your foundational advice for someone to help and to help them understand what their talents are and how to place those talents into the work world in a way that then they can build a successful career. Yeah, I remember years ago, I, I think there was a book or an article called Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow. And I and mm -hmm. and I really believe that. And mm -hmm. and I remember I did a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And I met the guy who wrote it. I knew his son years later. My mom gave that to me in high school. And I am a fundamental believer that, is that God gives us gifts and we're meant to use them. And he doesn't give us all every gift. And if we're trying to do work in an area that we're not gifted in, just because people say that's the cool job to have or we think we can make a lot of money, we're going to be miserable and, and, and not successful. So when I got out of college, Lila, I came from a pretty poor family and, and not college educated. And I um, worked very hard and I got a job interview with the number one place to work in America that year. And it was a management consulting firm. And so I interviewed there because they paid well and it was supposed to be prestigious and everybody else wanted to work there. So I interviewed and I got a job offer and I took the job. Well, as it turns out, 40 years later, based on some work I've done recently, I realized it was exactly the wrong job for me. And I spent two years there, which is the longest decade of my career. And I left there feeling like I was actually stupid and lazy. And I was neither of those things, but it scarred me. And had I known how to discover what my gifts were and realize they weren't going to be put to use there, I would have said, hey, this might be the best job in the world for some people, but it's the worst job for me. But so many of us pick our careers or our jobs or our next promotion based on what the world is telling us. But what we have to pay attention to is what did God give me and what am I meant to do? Just yesterday, I was, we were talking about, like I met a guy recently and he said, hey, I love what I do. But we were talking about promoting him and he goes, I don't want to be the leader. I like to support leaders and I like to help them. And yet so many times we think, well, I guess my next job should be to be the leader or the manager. And it's like, that's not what everybody's called to do. So my advice to people would be know yourself and what God gave you and be really glad to use those things and everything else falls into place. We Heart Nutrition is the highest quality research-backed ingredients in beautiful vitamin packages 
for your health. We Heart Nutrition crafts packages of vitamins specifically for every woman at every stage of their life. So they have your everyday multivitamin for women. They have your prenatal vitamin for women. They have your maximizing your body for fertility package. They have your postnatal package, your premenopausal package, your postmenopausal package. And what's so wonderful about WeHeartNutrition.com is that this is all sourced in the United States with the highest quality ingredients and that all the ingredients are in their most bio-identical form for the easiest absorption into your body. I love We Heart Nutrition because it's not just a best-in-class product, but this is a company based in the United States run by a small family business that is 100% pro-life. And in fact, WeHeartNutrition.com is donating 10% of all of their sales directly back to the pro-life movement to support moms and babies in need through the Pregnancy Center movement. You're going to love WeHeartNutrition.com because it's an amazing product. It's going to help you be healthier. And you're also going to know that you're partnering with a company that shares your values and that generously donates 10% back of all sales to the pro-life movement. So go to WeHeartNutrition.com today, put in your order for vitamins for whatever stage of life you are at, and use the code LILA at checkout for a full 20% off your order. That's WeHeartNutrition.com. Use the code LILA at checkout for 20% off your order. And by the way, if for whatever reason you don't like the product, it's not working for you, there is a full 60-day back guarantee that you can return the product, no questions asked in 60 days, and you can get a full refund. So there's no reason why not. Check out WeHeartNutrition.com today and use the code LILA at checkout for 20% off your order. Okay, so so many questions from what you just said. Excellent stuff. Let's start with this question. Immediately, you mentioned your own story about being burnt out in this job that wasn't suited to you. You went on and eventually found a table group and now you're extremely successful. People might be listening and say, well, that works for Pat. He's clearly extremely talented and driven and he's built this amazing thing. I am going to you know, make good with my current job because I can't imagine something necessarily better that would actually pay me. And so, you know, I'm not like Pat. I'm not that kind of talent. You know, I have these other interests and hobbies, but, you know, I'm going to kind of slug it, slug it through because I need to support my family or I need a job or whatever. What would you say to that person? Well, I would say, first of all, I, I, I totally understand the, the requirements of paying the bills and doing all those things. So I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish and say, quit your job and go do some whatever right away because we all have to have responsibility. And I certainly didn't start out by going for just the one thing I liked. We have to do mm -hmm. things we don't like sometimes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but here's what I would say. Find out everybody is super talented, but not in every way. Mm -hmm. And I am literally terrible at some really important things that people would think you have to be good at to be successful. And knowing what those things are is wonderful because then I can surround myself with people who are great at those things and know that together, we see God designed us to need one another. And if I surround myself by people that have the same gifts I do, we're going to be just as blind to our pit, to our blind spots as, as anybody. So, so know who you are and then find the role. And it's not about even finding the right industry, Lila. It's about in any given company, you can find a role that taps into the strengths God gave you. Mm -hmm. Here's a great story. So we did this thing called the six types of working genius, which I think we'll probably talk about. <laughs> I had a guy, and I think he was working at a big church, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he had a performance review with his boss and his boss's boss, and it was going to go really badly because he had not been doing well, and he knew that. So he was dreading his performance review and he took the working genius assessment and, and, and saw the profile of what his God-given talents were and what they weren't. And so before the performance review, he went and handed the, to his boss and said, can you look at this real quick before we get started? And the guy looked at it and said, well, no wonder you've been doing terrible. This, this job is totally wrong for you. And then him and his boss said, wait a second, we have that other job. You would be perfect for that in the same organization, same industry, different role. He goes, I got promoted instead of fired because they got to see who I was and realize there were other things I could do there. And so many people are miserable in their jobs and they don't exactly know why. And they're not even allowing their manager or the company where they work to properly utilize them. So that's the message I want to have to you because you're, you have a lot of young people that are listening to this early in their career or just starting out or in their first or second job. And they think, do I have to start over if this isn't working for me? And the answer is no. There's probably a job within the organization you work in or somebody else that needs you. And as long as you know what you're great at, 
you can help people put you to work and have joy and fulfillment and energy that serves you and your family. So I love helping people figure that out. That's such a good point because if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, there are all kinds of industries, you know, whether it's like media or finance or small business or teaching or whatever. And it sounds like what you're saying is largely speaking within many different kinds of organizations and many different industries, it's less about the big end game and product of the, of the organization. You want excellence, you want to serve people, but it's more about what are you doing in the day to day? What is the actual, cause you know, I think we get stars in our eyes. We think about, I'd love to be, you know, a filmmaker. I'd love to do this or that. And yeah, maybe, maybe you would love to do that, but it's really thinking about what do I do in the day to day to achieve this thing that looks attractive to me? And am I suited? Am I really, is my, my aptitude? Is that what I actually would enjoy doing in that day to day? that lifestyle, you could say, of the job. So I'd love to now just break right into what is this know thyself, know myself tool that you have recently developed. I've used it uh, in full disclosure. I have all my team at Live Action use it. I'm using it over at GTB Media. I know so many people who are using it and just love it. It's so eye-opening. Tell us about how one can start the process of really knowing themselves so that they can best find the job for them and the career for them. Great. What, what I want to say first is that I love all these tools. You know, there's there's Myers Briggs and there's Disc and a whole bunch of others. And so I'm a junkie for all of them, and we've used them. But this one is different because, like you said, and I love the way you say it, it's about the work you do every day. And it takes 12 minutes to fill this out, and you read the report, and you're like, "Oh, no wonder Thursdays are miserable for me because I have to do all these things that I'm terrible at, and no wonder I look forward to those projects. And maybe I can go about my job in a way that I get to do more of the things that I'm really that give me joy and energy and less of the others. But I also want to say this, Lila, you were involved in developing this tool because you, your, your personality type in, in working genius is the same as my wife and my best friend, Chris Stefanik, who, you know, <laughs> and, and we actually had your name on the board when we were figuring this out. So we were like, well, Lila and Chris and Laura are WIs. Let's figure out what do we call that and what do we understand? So, so you were there from the very beginning because we were working with you and we know you. So let me tell <laughs> like, people about the, the six types of working problematic. What do we do with this problematic person of Lila with her <laughs> WI, her crazy WI? No, I, 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 when, I, when you told me about the tool the first time, I was like, this is so, it was so, it's so refreshing to have a categorization that resonates that then gives you guidance for what to do. Like that's actionable. So anyways, excited for you to get into it. Yeah. So you were part of that. Okay. And it's so fun. Your name comes up with my wife and I'll be in an argument with her and I go, I love you, Laura. I love Chris. I love Lila too, <laughs> but you're not good at everything. <laughs> so it's great. So, um, so the six types of working genius, basically it comes down to this. There are six activities that are involved in any kind of work. I don't care if you're launching a startup company, if you're running a business, if you're building your family's home, you're running your household, you're planning a family vacation, there are six kinds of activities that are always required, okay? And none of us are good at all six. In fact, of those six, two of them are what we call our working genius. Everybody has two that, that, that feeds them, that gives them joy and energy. When we work in our area of genius, we can spend 12 hours a day doing it and go home and feel like yeah, that was awesome. And then there's two on the other end that drain us of joy and energy. Two or three hours of doing that can make us exhausted, you know? And then there's two in the middle, which are, which we can do. They don't really feed us, but they don't crush us either. And so every person needs to know like, which two are my geniuses, which I should lean toward, which two are my frustrations, which I should just grit my teeth when I have to do it, try not to do it too often, but when I have to, I just need to steal myself for it. And then the two in the middle, you can kind of leverage and, 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 and figure out your way. So here's what the six geniuses are. The first one, you have the first two, Lila. I love this. The first two are at the highest altitude. They're like up at 50,000 feet. And it's wonder is the first one, the genius of wonder. These are people that ask the big questions, that ponder things, that say, why is why should it be that way? I wonder if there's a better way to do this. Why does the world work this way? Or why does our organization work this way? Or I wonder what our customers really think. Wonder is where every new thing starts. Somebody asks the question. A woman who worked for me, Amy, was a wonderer. And she's the one who said to me one day, 
why do you get grumpy at work sometimes? And that's what <laughs> led us to figure out this model. So everything starts with somebody saying wonder. But as you know, Lila, when you're young, your teachers don't say, oh, I'm so glad you're asking these big questions. They're like, just do the assignment, follow directions. And wonderers are, are in their head thinking about these big things. And it's beautiful. And they're often criticized for doing it when they're young. Okay. The next genius, which is your other genius, is called invention. So when a wonderer asks the question, the person with invention comes up with the solution. And they love to come up with new ideas out of nothing, out of thin air. They're like a, a blank whiteboard and a pen is like a joy to them. <laughs> so these first two, wonder and invention, is what's called ideation. Well, Lila, you are the physical embodiment of ideation. You are constantly like, shouldn't there be a better way to do that? Oh, I have an idea. Oh, there's another thing. I have another idea. And you can just do that. I'm sure your husband will say you're, you do it all the time. You wake up in the morning ready to ideate. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So those are the first two, which are yours and my wife. But the next one is called discernment. And that now, we're, now we're getting out of the clouds a little lower and getting a little closer to the ground, not too close. People with the gift, the genius of discernment, can they have this intuition and instinct and gut feel and pattern recognition where somebody brings them an idea and they're the ones that look at it and go, oh yeah, that's gonna be a huge one. Or, oh no, no, I have a feeling that there's some problems. Or you need to tweak a few things here. And, and it's wonderful to watch ideation interact with discernment because they'll take your idea and put it back to you and go, you need to work further on these things. I have a discerner who edits my books mm -hmm. and I'll send her a chapter at night and the next morning she'll read it and go, this character makes no sense or, oh, I really like what you did here and I know mm -hmm. that she's right. So discernment is the ability to respond to things and see them and evaluate them using instincts, not data, not expertise, but just, I have a woman in my office, you know, Tracy, who just oozes discernment. She's the editor of my books. And you know what she said, and this is great. When she was a little girl, her friends were always asking her, what do you think? Ask Tracy. Should we do that? Ask Tracy. And Tracy always had this sense of like, that would not be a good idea, or that would be. When Laura and I are at home, Lila, she can say, do you think we should refinance the house? Where should we go on vacation this year? How should we handle this thing in our lives? And she'll go, why don't you ask Tracy? Because Tracy has this ability to look at something and go, I think that's probably the best idea. And mm -hmm. she's usually right. So she evaluates things really well. W, I, and D happen pretty high up there. But once you've discerned something, Lila, then somebody has to galvanize it. They have to sell it. They have to get people excited. They have to pitch the idea. And not just once, because you and I like to do it once. But they have to every day go, I'm going to get in front of people. And I don't want to do that every day. I want to move on to the next big thing. <laughs> and so that's how this whole tool came about is because mm -hmm. every day I'd come to work and people would go galvanize us. And I'd be like, I don't want to. I want to move on to the next thing. And I go, no, galvanize us on what we need to do again today. And that's when I found Cody. And I thought, you know, Cody, he's on your board. And, and I said, Cody, you have the genius of galvanizing you're going to be my chief gal galvanizing officer. And he's like, well, I haven't been here that long. I'm not very old. And I'm like, I don't care. It's a gift. God made you a galvanizer. And he was like, are you going to let me use it? And I'm like, yes. And I'm going to do it less. And so galvanizing is the energy people get from just getting in front of people and saying, come on, you guys, let's do it. And they remind people and they, they get people moving. So then the, those two middle ones, the D and the G, that's called activation. The last two, Lila, are implementation. These are, you are my least interest. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I'm like, peace out. <laughs> Can someone else implement, please? You know? No, it's so, and, but these people are gold. We, these are like, and, and you know, people listening, well, my head's not in, you know, I don't have the big idea. It's like, no, you are, you are necessary for any idea to ever come into existence. So I'm very excited about these last two. Exactly, and I <laughs> celebrate them. I, I tell them, I suck at that. And I love that you're great at it and you are as important as I am, no doubt. I was telling somebody that today. It's like, just because I came up with the idea doesn't mean that it's all mine. We tend to over-prescribe um, genius to inventors. 
because it's a different kind of skill. But the genius, the next genius of enablement is beautiful. Now, enablement sounds bad because people are like, don't enable people if they have a drinking problem, you know. <laughs> but enabling others to get things going, these are the people that when you when you when we go to them, Lila, and go, we have this idea. It's been it's been discerned. We think we should do it. And when somebody gets in front of them and says, let's do it, they're the ones that go, I'll do it. I'm in. Tell me what you want me to do. And they get joy and energy out of answering the call. They literally get energized and get excited when somebody says, I need your help. Whereas, and I hate to say this, Lila, because I'm a follower of Jesus, but when my wife says, hey, I need your help, <laughs> my first thing is, oh, no, what do you need? And if it falls in my areas of genius, I'm very excited. But if she just says, I just need you to do what I ask you to do, I'm like, oh, no. And there's other people that are like, hey, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Mm -hmm. They are the glue of organizations. They are the most valuable team players. And most of them don't think they're a genius. They think they're just mm -hmm. nice. It's a genius to be able to say, I got your back. I'll do whatever you need me to do. It's such a valuable thing. And organizations that don't have enablement rarely get things off the ground. The last genius is called tenacity because it's one thing to say, I will help. Then there's those people in the world who love to finish things. The last 10%, they don't feel good unless it's done. They love to hit the target, meet the goal, nail thing, and keep going until it's definitely finished. And that's when they feel good. Where you and I are like, Hey, I love the first 15%. <laughs> so, so if you don't have people with all of these geniuses in a company, on a team, even in a family, it can be a challenge. It's amazing how you'll start to hit the same problems again and again. Or if you're asking somebody every day to do something that's not one of their geniuses, and definitely if it's one of their frustrations, you're going to burn them out. A lot of people, and Cody loves to say this, burnout isn't about working too hard. Burnout is about doing the kind of work that drains you of energy. So when I'm burnt out at work and people go, you should take more time off. What I, I say this now, actually, I should just go, do, I should just do the things I love doing. That'll re-energize me because mm -hmm. going home and staring at a, at a wall isn't going to re-energize me. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but doing the things I love is what's going to re-energize me. So anyway, such, look at how such, excited I was to do I my work. I have fireworks going off in the background. <laughs> no, it's genius. I have so to the figure fireworks. out how to deactivate that. Yeah, the genius had to go off because it was just, a, you know, the fireworks had to go off because it was genius. Okay, I've got a lot of questions here to, to dial more into this. So first question, do you think that there are a number of industries maybe like banking or finance as an example, that is more tailored to one type of genius versus another. I know you said in any given organization, you do need all, and I believe that to be true. But, you know, certain kind of geniuses tend towards certain professions, generally speaking. Have you, have you found that? Yes, to a certain extent. But I love your caveat, and that is mm -hmm. every, every business needs everything. But, but, like, but a, a pencil factory... <laughs> that's making number two pencils that haven't changed in the last hundred years is going to have a little bit less, oh, no, a lot less wonder and invention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what they might wonder and invent around is like, is there a better way to do this? Is there a quicker way we can serve them and do all that? But yes, there are certain industries, a think tank, you know, or an organization like yours is going to skew toward wonder and invention mm -hmm. and discernment. Cause like we're coming up with new ideas and we, we, we want to convey those to people. We got to evaluate, is that what they need to hear? So yes, a think tank is going to skew more toward the upper part. With the, like the, when I say upper, I mean like the head in the clouds a little bit more. And a, a factory that's making widgets, it's going to be a lot more toward E and T. Mm. But what's interesting is like take a company like, like Nike. We, had, we talked to a guy at Nike in innovation right when we came out with Working Genius. And he said they have people in W and I that design new products. You know, oh, we'll put gel in this thing and then we'll put a little swoosh on it. And, and, then, and then they would take it and send it over to the – throw it over the wall and give it to people in implementation, like in manufacturing or sales. And they would be like, why do they keep sending us these crappy products? And the people in, in the product development were like, why can't they sell these awesome products? And they didn't have anybody in the middle discerning mm. and galvanizing. And they said, we don't have anybody in the activation stage. So every business needs all of it. Mm. But yeah, I would think in banking and 
and, a, you know, in certain businesses, there's a lot of execution and that that's going to skew a little bit more toward the, 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 the G E T part. But, but it's really important to understand, you know, here's a great story. When I first came out with working genius, I had a pastor call and he said, Oh, Pat, I feel like I, I just took the working genius. And for 20 years, I felt like a fraud as a pastor. I said, why? And he goes, I can't write a homily or a sermon to save my life. My friends can go for a walk in the woods and come up with a three part series. And I will sit and stare at a wall for two days and come up with nothing. And I looked at his working genius and I said, do you like to counsel people? And he goes, oh yeah. How about when people have grief or problems in their family? Oh, I can spend all day with them and give them advice and help them. I said, yeah, that's, you're, you're a pastoral pastor. You're not so much of a, you're, you don't lean toward the coming up with a new idea and the homily. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, those people that come up the homilies aren't good at what you do. And everybody thinks they're supposed to be good at all of it. And nobody's good at all of it. And, and that's where the imposter syndrome comes in. Everybody thinks that, oh, I'm supposed to, I'm also supposed to be good at finishing things. Now, I will say this to you, Lila. This is personal. People get a little personal glimpse into Lila Rose here. <laughs> and you and I have some things in common. We have actually in our lives, probably because of wounds and, and, and childhood experiences, mm -hmm. gotten pretty damn good at, at getting things done. But we don't like it. <laughs> And Truly, like, like true. you probably got great <laughs> grades in school. So did mm -hmm. I, because we felt like I have to achieve. I have to prove that I'm worth it. I've got to do this. And so I actually learned how to push through and grind, but it was always a grind. Mm -hmm. And the, the liberation of realizing I don't have to be a finisher to be valuable. And I can partner with people who love that and celebrate that they're good at something that I don't enjoy. That's a huge relief in life. Sevenweekscoffee.com is America's pro-life coffee company. This delicious coffee is organically farmed, it's pesticide-free, it's small batch roasted, and it's low acid. You're going to love the different blends and roasts that they have on sevenweekscoffee.com. But what I love about this company, besides the best cup of coffee you're gonna drink, is that sevenweekscoffee.com gives back a full 10% of all of their revenue, not just their profits, directly to serve moms and babies in need. In fact, they have donated over $450 thousand dollars already to pregnancy resource centers to help moms and babies and right now through their drink more coffee save more lives campaign they are working to reach half a million dollars donated directly to moms and babies in need so if you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today you can get 15 percent off your order and a free tote that says drink more coffee save more lives helping seven weeks coffee get to that half a million dollars donated. You will get a subscription to this delicious coffee. And if you use the code LILAT checkout, you'll get an additional 10% off your order for a full 25% off your first sevenweekscoffee.com order. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com to help fuel your morning with a delicious cup of coffee, as well as fuel the pro-life movement and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 25% off your first order. That's Lila at checkout at sevenweekscoffee.com. Such a good point. I actually was meditating on this recently in just the last year that the, when I'm in that grind state, being the tenacity, right? Or even being having to be the galvanizer or the enablement to get the thing finished, right? And I'm doing that a lot of that. Obviously you feel burnt out, it's very tough. But also the other disadvantage is that you're not investing your space, your, your time into your, where your God-given aptitude is and your talent is. So it's not just that you feel burnt out, it's that the world's not getting and you're not being able to serve in the way that you're most maximized in. And that's the other tragedy of people not being in their working genius. You're not stewarding the gift God gave you. By the way, you're a, you're a, a mother, obviously, too. By the way, I'm, I'm, I think children are good. I, I'm very pro-child, I should just say that. <laughs> I know what you do, <laughs> and you, that's Pat. one of the things we have in common. But, um, but so my wife, who's your personality type too, so I wrote this mm -hmm. book uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago it came out. The, the, the tool came out four years ago. And um, she finished it, and she put it down, and she said, I said, what would you think? We were on an airplane. And she goes, I loved it, and I'm pissed. <laughs> and I said, why? And she goes, because I realized I've been feeling bad for – 25 years because so much of what she was doing as a mom were not in her genius. Wow. And, and what's, what's amazing, Lila, is just so people don't think I'm a Cretan, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we've, I, I always said to her, 
let's outsource some of the stuff that you don't like to do because she's not an E and a T, which means I'll, whatever my kids need and then I'll do it. And she was doing it and she was driving carpool and doing laundry and it was crushing her. Whereas other people, she had friends who were like, oh, I love this. I organize everything. I get things done. And she was feeling like, what's wrong with me? And now that she knows what her working geniuses are, she could have outsourced or or acknowledge that, and I would encourage her, but she thought, but I would be a failure, because look at these other mothers who thrive doing all this stuff, mm -hmm. and now she's like, now I realize I don't have that genius, and I don't need to feel guilty about that. So and for good. years, she felt yeah. guilty. It's so good. That's why I, I don't like doing my, completing my laundry. I like starting the load, <laughs> but then it's exactly. There. But um, I mean, as a, a half of it is a joke, but half serious, you know, it, it makes me wonder, because as I look at this system of this framework that you've developed, it makes me wonder, you know, I believe God is such intentionality with every soul he creates with every person oh. on the planet. Right. So do you think, you know, is it maybe too much to say that when God creates whatever population we have on planet earth right now at this day and age at this time this era and this time in history that if we figure it out as human beings and our own formation our own self-awareness and partner with other people we can create some really fantastic mutually uh serving and ultimately you know mission oriented systems not just in our businesses but in our communities in our family structures you know in our parishes in, in all parts of life absolutely and that's why when you think about like an abortion it's like, I, I was just thinking about this. I was listening to the Bible in a year and it was the Old Testament and God was upset because these people were drifting away from him. And like, they talked about a king, an Israeli king who, and they were, they were, he sacrificed his child, they said, like they were doing sacrifices. And I, and I remember in, I was in my car and I was like, oh, sacrifice. And I thought, oh crap, that's what people do now. And I thought every time a child is, aborted, that, that DNA, that working genius, that Myers-Briggs type, that personality, that soul, there's no one like it. And I know it seems very theoretical and heady to say this, but when a person is destroyed, we're depriving the world of the gifts that God wanted to give the world through them. And um, that's very real. And so, yeah, we need each other and we need everyone. And that's the, the sadness of drug addiction and homelessness and all these things is those are children of God who have something to offer. Mm -hmm. And that's why one of the most dignifying things you can give somebody is like a, a purpose or a job. So they realize, oh, yeah, I have a place here. And so anyway, drifted into so the pro-life ministry, but it's all real. It's so true. Okay, some practical applications of this framework for people listening, okay? So let's start with, um, well, I want to start, I had this question earlier, type A people. So if someone's listening, they're like, I, okay, I've always thought of myself as type A, or maybe if we talk temperaments, they say I'm more, of a, I'm more of a choleric, I have that streak in me, or I have an aspect of my melancholic that's really type A. And so how, what, any thoughts on taking other frameworks that we maybe have used historically more traditionally, like the type A personality or the choleric personality, um, you know, the commander personality and using that, you know, putting that, running that through the working genius framework. Absolutely. In fact, I'm one of the things I'm working on right now, and my wife, Laura is working on it too. Um, cause we're just about to be empty nesters. My youngest Lila is going away to college in five weeks. <laughs> and so Laura's like, okay, I'm going to finally work on this is like, we use the Myers Briggs a lot here and, and, and the choleric mm -hmm. and the, and the sanguine and all those things are like a temperament analysis, the Catholic version of Christian version, but it's, it's very similar to that. Understanding both of them is very powerful, but they're different. Mm -hmm. So Myers Briggs, for instance, or temperaments, as you were saying, that's more of the noun. That's who, that's our preferences for living, our personality type. That's the noun of who we are. The working genius is what we like to do. Hmm. And so what we found is like, so you and I are both ENFPs in the Myers-Briggs. Hmm. We have different working geniuses. I met a guy recently who is a similar personality to ours and he's an ET, which he likes implementation. I was like, hmm. how can you like implementation? He goes, Oh, listen, I'm an idealist. So I like to work at churches and nonprofits, mm -hmm. but I like to get crap done. And so they're different. And, and who you are and what you like to do are different things. One's a verb and one's a noun. So I love when people combine other, other things to understand fully who somebody is. The other thing we have to understand is what our wounds are. 
because and when you said type A, I thought, gosh, what really is type A? Mm. Is it and you can be a type A with any working genius, but you're going to go about it differently. But one of the, the I'm working on a book right now about wounds, because what I found is all the leaders I work with and all the people I meet, if you don't understand the impact of the, their wounds on who they are, it's really easy to misunderstand them as a person. And so many of us, Lila, especially successful people, their wounds, they kind of start to see them as superpowers because they've made it work for them in their life. And as they get older, they start to realize this is crushing me, but I'm, I'm being rewarded in my company or in the market or in life by doing it. But it's not actually keeping me, giving me peace and happiness. Mm -hmm. And so, so I say, learn about the choleric and the Myers-Briggs and your temperament, learn about your working genius, and then ask yourself, am I actually acting in who I want to be? Or am I doing things because I feel like I have to because of things mm -hmm. that happened in my life? So that's a, that's a very long answer to a quick question, but that's one of the things I would encourage people to do. And it's very, it's actually very powerful. There's so much there. How would someone, first of all, how would someone know that they have wounds and how would they discover what those wounds are in order to hopefully heal and pursue the, the maybe the lifestyle or the jobs that are more in line with their God-given talents? So I, the, I'm so glad you asked that. I'm, it's a big I topic, I know. You're, <laughs> yeah, but I love the fact that an issue comes out there and you don't go like, oh, that'll just float away. Okay, so how do we do that? I love mm -hmm. that. And, and Bob Schutz, you know Dr. Bob Schutz. Um, mm -hmm. You know who he is, right? Yeah, we had him on the show last he, summer, actually. I thought so. I, I, that's why I said yeah. that. He, his book, Be Healed, mm -hmm. um, is really good. It's wonderful. Uh, it's a faith-based look at healing, but it's also psychologically because they go together, of course, faith and reason. And um, he actually has like a list of the seven wounds and the things, mm -hmm. the, the things we say to ourselves when we have those wounds and the, and the decisions and the vows we make. And you can go through that and go, oh, like I looked at the list and I said, oh, yeah, I had that one. Oh, I say that all the time. Oh, I did that. Yeah, these are my three wounds. And there's, there's a list of seven. And it really explains a lot because like, I don't know why I worked so hard in college and high school. My personality, Lila, you and I should never have gone to every class and, and gotten straight A's because we should have been the kind of people that said, I'm not interested in that. I don't know if that class really matters. I'm going to follow <laughs> my heart and my passion. But we were like, no. That was college for me. That was college for me, Pat. Finally, I was enough healed, not, not fully healed, but it was a more of a whatever self-discovery. And yeah, let's just say I didn't go to class much, but in high school, I did go to every class and I majorly burnt out. Right. Well, I kept doing it in college too, totally <laughs> against the grain. And I look back and I go, why would I have done something so antithetical to my personality? Okay. People listening, like, by the way, I just have to stop us for a minute because they were like, what are these guys talking about? You're not supposed to, you, it's better to not go to class when you're in high school. That's more being more true to your personality. I'm, I guarantee you someone's thinking that right now as they're listening. Are you saying some people yeah. shouldn't go to class in high school? Well, no, what I, what, what happened with me is I, not everybody, like I have a son who's just graduating high school mm -hmm. and I know what his working genius and his Myers-Briggs are. He is not geared to be a grinded out and, and thankfully he did pretty well in school, but I knew not to over, in, uh, over uh, get on top of him because he does not have a very structured, um, and what we tend to do with our kids is we go, they're not structured, so I'm gonna ride them hard mm -hmm. so that they're gonna feel like there's something wrong with them. Well, he is meant to explore different things, take different classes and figure things out. And if he gets a B plus in a class that he likes, that's better than getting an A plus in a class he doesn't mm -hmm. and crushing himself. So what I'm mm -hmm. saying is, I should have blown off a few assignments that I didn't need to do. I should have calculated the thing and said, I don't need to do that to do well in this class. But I did everything every teacher and every coach mm -hmm. and every parent wanted me to do because I felt like that was my way to justify my, my, myself. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to college, no, there's classes that are – like I love that my kids now – I have a, a son in college and he's like, yeah, I never go to that class. It's stupid. It's not on the test. It's a waste of time. Good for you for figuring that out <laughs> on your own. <laughs> So no, but if you're in high school, you're going to get in trouble if you don't go to class. So do that. <laughs> well, maybe you're, it's a, it's a, a bit of a case for homeschooling what you just said, but I digress. Oh. That's another topic. Um, if I had to do all did, over again, I would have done that. 
You know, there's a lot there. Um, Okay, so more practical application. So if someone's listening and they are, maybe they already have a job and they, you know, maybe they got an English degree and they were applying to work at some not-for-profit in some sort of like entry-level type position. How does someone in their work, first of all, once maybe they take your online test, they discover their working genius, they're like, ah, this is working, this is not. How do they then communicate that or you know, maybe it negotiates a strong word, but maybe negotiate quite frankly, or, or at least find a way to work to their strengths, their genius. But again, they have a boss, they have a job description, they're not the top of the food chain, so they don't get to call the shots. What, what advice would you give them? Well, the beauty of this is it's so interesting and curiosity inducing. I would say just share it and just say, mm-hmm. hey, bo-, and, and if your boss is not a total cretin or, an, or, or, or an, <laughs> just terrible, just say, hey, here's a one-page description or a very short and of, of who I am. And they're going to go, wow, where did you get? This is really interesting. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow, I've been managing you wrong. Or there's other things that you could do. Or this explains a lot. And, and it even gives them vocabulary to go, oh, so the tenacity thing, when I give you those things to do, you're going to have to find a way to be it, – it just allows you to have handles around that. You don't have to negotiate because most decent places are like, I want to use my people. And your boss is going to go, oh, I got to find out what I am. Because when they're managing you, they want to know that too. So I would say the practical thing to do is take this thing, show it to your team and to your, and to your manager, and you are going to be shocked at how they inevitably will kind of what I would call reorganize the work Hmm. around what people love and what they don't love. And it's, it doesn't even, so I worked with a, with a big technology company, multi-billion dollar technology company, and they, they hadn't come up with a new product in years and they were frustrated. Hmm. They never gotten recognized for it. They did the working genius and they realized nobody on their team had wonder or invention, which is ideation, except one guy had invention as a genius. Everybody else had it very low and he was the lawyer. He was the company lawyer. (laughs) You know what they did? Within like a half hour, they go, hey, we're going to put new technology acquisition under you. And the lawyer was like, me? They're like, yeah, you're good at it. He goes, actually, I love that kind of stuff. And so they actually, they didn't change his title. They didn't, they just said, you're going to take over that responsibility. We're going to give you a few more employees and you get to do that. And he was psyched. Well, a couple years later, I went and looked on the website and I was, I wonder what that guy's doing. And he was gone. Well, I thought he was gone because he was no longer the chief legal officer. They took him out of legal completely and he was full-time in technology. Wow. So most decent companies want to find the best way to use their people. So go to your boss and just go, hey, I want you to understand who I am. And at the very least, they're going to have more empathy for what you are great at and what you might struggle with. You talked a little bit about the WIs and the sorts of jobs that might be conducive to them, you know, inventors thinking big ideas. You mentioned think tanks or, you know, starting things, um, entrepreneurial projects. Can you kind of run us through maybe just high level the different parts of working genius and the potentially the types of roles or jobs that generally speaking people might be best suited to, to give them that framework, to add to the framework? Sure. So since there's six types, there's 15 combinations or pairings. And every time you take it, you get the list of pairings and you can read those. By the way, we have a student version for young people too now that we just put out. And young meaning like in their first couple years of college even because they they don't have the work experience so the questions are asked differently. But the the point is that um, different – so in those six types, if, if you are toward the the bottom end, which is landing the plane, like G, E, and T, galvanizing people, enablement, and tenacity, get jobs that have definition and clarity about what, what finished is and, and what success looks like. I hired a guy. He's, my, he's a year younger than me. He, he knows you. He knows who you are. He's very supportive. He's an ET. I'd never had an ET. I hire him and I go, Joe, you figure out whatever you want to do. <laughs> and you tell me what success looks like. Cause that's what I would love to say. And he goes, Pat, you're killing me. I'm like, why? That would be the greatest job ever. He goes, no, no, no. I want to know what the deliverables are, what success looks mm-hmm. like, what the system is and the structure. And I realized, oh, wow. 
So the, the point here is if you're a, a wait, G-E-T- I just got to pause you here because I just learned something. I mean, I've been learning things from you my you know last decade, but I just learned something new that I could implement starting today, which is I have a tendency, especially when I'm building a new team to say, tell me what you want to do. To, you know, write your job description, come up with your deliverables. Here's the big idea. But I realized that for some people that is actually really frustrating and not what yes. they want to be. They want to be told. And that's going to be part of their working genius to be told that they can execute flawlessly on what they're told. So I'm actually doing it. I'm, I'm actually expecting them to be like me when I don't want them right. to be like me. I want them to be, I need them to be like them. So thank you for that, Pat. I, I, I learned something just in this moment. So I appreciate that. It's- and it's very common. And, and similarly, mm-hmm. and if you're a WI or an ID like me, find a job or, 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 or in your job, find a way to tap into the, the evaluation of things and the coming up with mm-hmm. new ideas. And it might be within the context. So let's just say you work at a software company. Well, there's jobs for every kind, but don't get a job if you're an ID or a WI like us that is super defined, super limited, and you come in Mm -hmm. and you have to do something in a prescribed way. And sometimes the very job you have, your boss can go, hey, why don't we just change the way you do it? Your responsibilities are the same. Okay, let me give you an example. When I was a kid, my dad, God rest his soul, used to get me up to mow the lawn every Saturday. He loved it. I hated it, Lila. Mm -hmm. And for years I felt guilty because I loved my dad and, and I know he wanted me to go help him. But it was just awful. And I felt like, what a terrible son. When I came up with Working Genius, I realized he wanted me to follow him around. And whenever he told me to do something, to do it and to do it perfectly. (laughs) Which is exactly like That sounds like (laughs) H-E-L-L. I mean, that sounds like the worst for a WI or even an ID like you. I mean, that sounds, I can see why that was like terrifying to you. But for like, you know. The end of it, like for 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 a T, you know, or for an E, that's like, please give me more. I want to follow you around and do every last detail you tell me. And you know what I realized? A couple times he would go, "Hey, you do the backyard," and and I'd say, "I'll figure it out, Dad." And I would mm. go back there and I would like, "Hey, I think we should get some plants here. I'm gonna I'm gonna mow it and make cross hatches in it to make it look cool." <laughs> like I was designing what the backyard was looking like, and it was so much fun. And so get the. Is, even a gardener, two gardeners can go about the job differently. Two second grade teachers will have totally different ways of teaching a class. One of them, is, and we, I did a thing for educators. One of them would, would say like, oh, I have a, a, a lesson plan and I do it every time. And if you do your test, I'll have it back the next day. And I always grade the papers. And you know, you're sitting there going, oh, I would never do that. You and I would go into class and go, hey, forget about the lesson plan, you guys. I just thought of something last night. <laughs> Everybody get up out of your chairs. We're going to do something. And, and then the parents might go, you know, my son turned into his test two weeks ago. You haven't got it back. Oh, I know, I know. But I'm really just trying to inspire. Two people doing the same job can do it completely differently. And they're both valid. Just know that and explain to people. You know, and like in a school, a principal should know, oh, yeah, Mrs. So-and-so, she does that. Mr. So-and-so, he actually teaches his class differently. Maybe they can work together to balance out some of the things they do, but let's just understand who they are and realize it's all good. Mm. So, so it's less about, it's just about how you go about doing what you do, less about the job itself. Such good stuff. Okay, we just have a few more minutes, but I want to ask about, I've been dying to ask about unusual pairings. You mentioned that there's only a certain number of pairings that can come out of the working genius, the six different types of genius. What about these pairings? So what about, as an example, the inventor coupled with tenacity? So you have an IT, someone who's a little bit in the clouds at 50,000 feet coming up with new stuff and then skip all the other stuff. Then they just like to directly do it themselves and get it done. We call that By the way, that kind of meth- person's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly. But we call them the methodical architect mm. because they come up with a new idea, but they have a method for implementing it. And, and what happens for them is you should do it the way they lay it out. But, but what they often don't understand is that human beings ha- don't necessarily do it that way. So they get very frustrated if you don't follow directions. And the thing they would say is if you did it the way I told you, it would have worked. And they're right. Mm. So the methodical architect is really good at designing a plan and putting things in place and and actually explaining how to implement it. And so their idea is predicated on the process, which is totally different 
than an, even one like it, how about an IE? They're called the adaptive designer. Mm. And, and they come up with a new idea. And if you go to them and go, oh, this doesn't work for me. They go, oh, that's okay. I'll come up with another one. And they'll mm -hmm. come up with another one. And they're not at all wedded to the outcome. They're wedded to like, I want to please you because I'm an enabling in mm -hmm. innovator. Does that make sense? That's really good. What about W wonder E enablement? I love this. The, the W E is probably the most sensitive kind mm -hmm. because they're, they're up in their head and they're thinking about, they're very idealistic but then they also want to please people. And these people get taken advantage of without realizing it because they do what you want them to do, but they do mm -hmm. think about it. And they're like, please appreciate me. And it's mm -hmm. easy to overlook them. They get really sad and nobody really knows it. And mm -hmm. so they're, and, and so boy, if you, if you've got a WE, make sure you're totally grateful for what they do. Mm -hmm. You're checking in with how they're feeling. And you know that they're likely to work themselves sick and feel like they can't say so. Mm, very good. And then what about, what about a D, a discerner um, G? And I know okay. we've talked before about DGs and how amazing and how much we love DGs. And Cody's a DG and I actually have a DG on my team that I am so grateful for. But tell me about a D, tell us about a DG, discerner, galvanizer. Yeah, they're the intuitive activator. They, they are quick to go. I got enough information that's going to work. Let's get started. So they're very quick to go enough, enough data. I feel good about it. What are we going to do now? So they are the intuitive activator. They get it and they, they want to move quick. Now there's downsides to every one of these types, these pairings, and there's, there's, there's words for every pairing. And it's so funny when people take it and they look at the, they look at the, the their pairing and their, the, the words we picked. And it's like, they're like, oh my gosh, that's so me. And what we always say is go to your friend or your spouse or your, your, your coworkers and show it to them. They're going to go, that is, that was written for you. You're the creative dreamer. Mm. You are the creative dreamer. And you know what, what you do? I love this, Lila. This is so fun. You constantly come up with new ideas. And even at half the questions, you're like, I wonder. And I love that you start there. And um, as a result on a team... There are moments where you create chaos. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I've learned this. I'm still learning this the hard way. But it's like you, you come up with and you're like, oh, that was just an idea. And everyone right. like off, to, off to the races implementing it. And then the next day you have a new one. They're like, wait a second. You literally told me yesterday we we're going this direction. You're like, that was we were just talking. That was just a fun conversation that I had with you. So totally. It, it's been very fun to fun. And uh, also you learn a lot to watch this in action. And then you know direct beautiful? it in action. <laughs> right. And you know what's beautiful? It's the prayer of St. Francis. Seek to understand. Mm -hmm. And it's like when people realize that you don't do that because you're like trying to blow them off or you're trying to change plans, you're like, hey, I just do this. They can actually say, oh, you're wi aren't you? And you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I say to people all the time, hey, I'm eyeing, I'm not g Because mm -hmm. they think if I throw it out there, I'm galvanizing them to act. And I'm like, no, 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 don't act. I'm just throwing this against the wall. So it's, it gives us a language to understand each other and to communicate better. And then Pat, you're, and we can end with this one. You are an ID. Yes. Although you do, do, I think you do wonder, what are your second two? Is it wonder, is it WG? Yes. That's right. So what's the, what are the hallmarks of ID? ID is the discriminating ideator. And that, mm -hmm. that means the, the. I come up with lots of ideas, but I'm constantly evaluating. Like, like the mm -hmm. first draft of the papers I write are damn close to the, to the answer. Mm -hmm. Because while I'm writing, and frankly, after that, I don't get it much better. Mm -hmm. So I don't do a lot of, I, I tweak as I go. And so when I come up with an idea, I've usually been kind of vetting it as I go. Because mm -hmm. I'm both, I like to evaluate and come up with ideas simultaneously. Now, let me tell you what I don't do well. I don't take people along with me. Like I'll come up with the, the answer and they'll be like, well, how did you get there? And, and you've skipped, you didn't even hear what I said, but I heard what they said and I went four steps down the road. And then I said, here's the answer. And they're like, are you going to explain to me how you arrived at that? And I'm terrible at that. Hmm. And so I jump ahead too quickly and I try to get to the answer too quickly. And, um, but I do, and, and my kids will say, it's kind of annoying because I'm often, I'm right more than I'm wrong. And it kind of drives them nuts because like, okay, you might be right, dad, but you still shouldn't have done it that way. And you're kind of pissing me off. <laughs> but is it, is it, I'm actually curious. I know we've got to wrap here in a minute. Is it tough for you to have to explain again and again and again 
this thing that you ID'd? Yes. And, and mm -hmm. we, we did this thing in, in, of called crave and crush. Like what mm -hmm. does each type crave the most and what crushes them? Mm -hmm. And I crave trust. When somebody mm -hmm. comes to me and says, hey, Pat, I need your advice and I'm going to trust that you're probably going the right direction. I love that. But what, I, what crushes me when somebody says, prove it, mm -hmm. or I don't think you're right. I hate to argue with that. And like you crave curiosity, like that somebody wants your new thinking. Like, oh, I love that. Tell me more about what you're thinking. And if they're like, yeah, that's stupid. That's not important. <laughs> it's like, oh, no. So we all crave certain things based on our mm -hmm. pairings, and we get crushed by things. And I really hate when people say, well, you're going to have to prove to me that you're, that works. All right. This has been such a treat that we could go on for hours, and we got to get you out and OC to do this, Pat, more because it's such good stuff. But where can people find Working Genius? Where can people find your books and learn more about this amazing tool? So Working Genius, with two Gs in the middle, workinggenius.com is the website. You can get everything there. There's tons of stuff, free stuff there, downloadable stuff, all that. Um, and it costs $25 to do the assessment, and it takes 12 minutes, and, and there's all kinds of stuff there. Also, teams can do it and do a team report and look at the whole team's working genius and mm -hmm. see where there's gaps and stuff. Um, I have a book called The Six Types of Working Genius, but I, I say do the assessment first, learn about it, and then it'll take you through how we came up with it and all the details. Um, but we also have a podcast for people that are, and it's grown like crazy where we just get on once every two weeks and do a, and talk for like 45 minutes about different parts of working genius. And we have like 3000 people certified in working genius now mm. where they take a two day class and they become an experts on it and then go out and do it for others. So we have a certification program that if people want to do that. And a lot of those people that get certified love to listen to the podcast and explore it more. Um, so that's, that's probably the best way to do it. Thank you Amazing. for asking Lila. Amazing. And the podcast is two of my favorite people, Pat Lencioni and Cody Thompson, and I, I highly recommend it. So excited to get people listening if they haven't already checked it out. Pat, you are amazing. Thank you so much for everything you do for me and so many other people. Can't wait to have you back on and keep, keep blazing trails. I love it. You're still my hero. Thank you for having me on and I, I miss you. God Thank bless. Thank you, Pat. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Check out Pat's work at the link in the description. I think the working genius is really going to serve you. I know it served me. And I also just find this kind of stuff so fun. I think that's because I am a WI and I love to just think about stuff, but I think it will actually practically serve you as Pat detailed. Also, don't forget, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. If you're on podcast app, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review and give us five stars. That helps the show reach more people. And if you're on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed and ring the notification bell. We've discovered that sometimes up to 80% of the people watching these videos aren't subscribed yet to the channel. So make sure you're subscribed to the Lila Rose podcast on YouTube as well. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you guys next time. And a huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, reaching millions with entertainment, news, and more. Check them out at EWTN.com.